I'm a licensed clinical social worker, haha, <laughs> still fun to say, and I um, predominantly work with young children and their parents, um, but a lot of that work includes couples as well, and so actually when I was in grad school, I got to, to just have a, a class that introduced me to the level one uh, version of something called the Gottman Method, and um, before we jump in and I explain more of that, let me share screen. So this is put out by the Gottman Institute. And um, so before we begin, just some kind of housekeeping things. Uh, hopefully everybody is familiar with Zoom and using this, but if you want to navigate away from the slide, I think if you're on a phone, you just swipe uh, or you can switch from gallery view to speaker view. Please feel free to engage either in the chat box or unmute yourself. Um, there's so much information in what we're going to be covering that I think it might be a little bit useless if we just stick to information. So as we're going, if you have questions that come up, um, please feel free to put those in the chat and then at different breaks between slides or things like that, I'll kind of be checking in to see what's there. Um, be mindful though when you do share that this session is being recorded and so it is kind of more of a workshop, definitely not a couples therapy session, so be mindful that any questions you ask or something you might share uh, will be put on YouTube afterwards, so please protect yourself and your relationships and being mindful of that. And then you've already done the last one, which is sharing what you're hoping to get out of our time together. Before we start, um, I always, the, especially workshop type things can be very overwhelming as you're inundated with information, especially if a lot of it is new, um, then it can just kind of be like, wow, that was great. And then somebody might say, what did, what'd you get out of it? And I have no idea. But it was great, but who knows, because it was, it was so much. So I wanted to pose these questions to you before we start um, so that you can kind of even if you want to have a journal in front of you or just a pen and paper. Um, but really some things to consider while we journey together this morning. What is something you might want to remember? Maybe something that you felt. It can be either a body sensation or an emotion. Um, something that you thought. Something that you want to think more about. And then also if there's like the one thing that when you come away at the end, here's the one thing. Maybe it was too much, but here's the one thing that I want to do, to try, to change, to start doing, to stop doing, to keep doing. Um, try to come away with one thing, one kind of gem that, you, that will make this time especially meaningful for you. Um, and I want to just comment on the second point there, something that I felt being a body sensation or an emotion. Sometimes our emotions, um, it's hard to talk about them. And it can be a nice kind of bridge to start with the body. And so even just right now, if you pay attention to your body and what's going on, what do you notice? And this is just rhetorical, you don't have to answer it. Um, but just what are you noticing in your body? Is there any tension anywhere? Um, maybe any anxiety coming up in your body that you're experiencing as we're going to talk about relationships. Um, are you feeling guarded at all or vulnerable or just pretty neutral? Um, so it's just good to pay attention to our bodies and then starting there and we can also then pay attention to what we're feeling and start to make some connections to help us make meaning of our time together, of our circumstances, our experiences. All right, so any, um, before we get started and jump in, any thoughts, comments, or shall we jump in? And Pastor Joseph will help me with uh, chat comments if I miss any, so. Okay. So the Love Lab, this is hilarious. So their work, the, the Gottmans, uh, John Gottman and Julie Schwartz Gottman, have been studying couples for 40 years, and they've been studying them, studying them in a longitudinal way. So some couples, they have followed over 20 years of their relationship. Um, and so the, the information that they have is deeply research-based and research-evidenced. 
And it also wasn't just from therapy sessions. They created what they call the love lab, which is like an apartment with cameras everywhere. And they just let people live. And they paid attention to all of their nonverbals, all of their verbals, their body language. Um, and part of the training, we got to watch some of those. And it's fascinating to see how much you can read into relationships. And so 40 years of really being able to look at um, completely authentic interactions between people. And they came away with some really um, evidence-based things. They call them the masters, the relationship masters, or disasters. And so they have these key markers that are typical for masters in relationship and also some things that are really common and things that we can look for that mark disaster relationships. I get, it's sad to even say that, but I think we all know that, that that's true, right? So 40 years, they've, they've worked with over 3,000 couples. It's a longitudinal study that they've done. It also involves physiology. And so if you look at the picture, um, they, they put little markers on people's body to mark their heart rate. Um, and this I thought was very unique when I learned about it because oftentimes we think of couples therapy just being a place where you go and you talk and sometimes you can leave more angry than, than you got there with. Um, and so this as a marker, can you imagine to have something that's monitoring your heart rate and as you're talking with your partner, if the monitor starts to recognize your heart rate is elevating, then it's sort of this red flag that says, hold on, regulate yourself and then let's continue. Um, because oftentimes conflict uh, or even just different discussions, we become dysregulated, but we don't pay attention to ourselves. We just keep trying to go and it usually doesn't end well. And so I thought that was a very unique component of what they do is actually use physiology to uh, work towards health and to help people attune to what's going on in their own bodies to then be able to engage their partner in a more healthy way. And then they also have the couple code this. So even now, if you went online and found a Gottman certi a certified Gottman uh, therapist, they would do this process with you too. You go, they hook you all up, they ask you to talk about your story, your, you know, your, your relationship, then they ask you to have a conflict in, right then <laughs> in front of them, and they're marking all of your physiology, but then they have you review the video as well to pay attention to what do you notice about how you're engaging within your relationship. So really fascinating as a method of therapy, very unique from what I think of when I think of more traditional methods of therapy. So that's a little bit of the history. And all right, so this is, I want to just go through two tools this morning. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time because each of these could be its own <laughs> full, you know, 45 minute session on each of these areas. But my hope is that just by having this tool, this is something you can easily print off of the internet, put it on your refrigerator. It just shows uh, different factors. And there might be some that we cover that you feel like, oh, that's really strong in my relationship. And others that you think, hmm, this might be where we need to put some attention in our relationship. Um, and so these are the kind of the positive elements. These are the markers of the master relationships. Uh, the masters, they all have these elements that they are building continually in their relationship. And then at the end, we're going to also um, learn about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And those are four markers that your relationship is headed for trouble. And it's not hopeless there because each of those four markers then also has something, an antidote for it. So something to work on if you recognize that that is part of your relationship. So this is our sound relationship house. It has stories. So we'll see the bottom story is to build love maps. And then the one on top of that, share fondness and admiration. Turn towards instead of away. And the positive perspective, managing conflict, making life dreams come true, creating shared meaning. And then all of these are held up by the tenets of trust and commitment within a relationship. So we're going to take, kind of just briefly go through each one, just give an introduction, just give something that is enough to say, ooh, this is where I want to I want to focus, or this one might be helpful in the relationship that I'm in. So if we start with building love maps, 
Knowing the little things about your partner's life creates a strong foundation for friendship and intimacy. And actually the bottom three here are all friendship. And I think that that's great because it's a friendship is a great place to start. It can feel less pressure than trying to fix or improve a romantic relationship to just say, let's doing these things, recognizing you're building and improving and deepening just a friendship, human to human um, with your friendship with each other. So the love map is basically knowing each other, um, just the, the, your person's world. So remembering important events in each other's lives, remembering what they like, what they don't like, knowing their preferences, um, uh, Mondo's latest, um, <laughs> trick hack for when I think of preferences, I think like favorite restaurants, things like that. So Mondo decided what he's going to do instead of saying, Hey, what do you want for dinner tonight? He would, cause I usually say, Oh, I don't know. And then he'll name something. And I'm like, no, not that. And I, he'll name something else. Oh no, not that. Um, so his, his new trick is he's going to say, Hey, I ordered Mexican food for dinner. And then if I say, oh, I was really wanting, you know, Indian food, then, then he'll go and order Indian food. Or if I say, oh, that's great. Mexican food sounds great. Then he'll then order Mexican food. So basically love maps are just, you're welcome to use that by the way, he hasn't trademarked that, that method yet. Um, so love maps, just knowing each other. Um, and there's actually, there's things, um, so I have stuff for children, but, right? but like little this is me cards that even there's um, grown up version, there's something called the Ungame. The Gottman um, Institute also puts out their own cards that are just cards that you can go through in a really informal way at the dinner table or when you're just over coffee in the morning that just help you build a friendship and know each other. Um, what helps is that this helps you to know the character of your partner and just who they are. And this is really important when you hit times of stress, because when you hit times of stress, either we can go into our own defense mechanisms, or if you really have invested in building this love map and in getting to know each other, it can introduce the possibility to respond instead defensively to say, huh, this isn't like you. I wonder what's going on right? Instead of, oh, well, you this, you that. Um, but if you've taken time to know and you, you, and to know, to learn and to remember, right? So remembering what those important things are that, that your partner has shared with you. Um, and, and if you cherish it and treasure it, that person feels cherished and treasured, right? So here's some examples of love map information, or if you ordered the cards, these are some of the questions that they ask, right? So um, and you, as I read them, you can just think of answers for yourself. You can try to think, do I know this about my partner? Or maybe I don't know that. Um, but I'll just, I'll just list off a few. So uh, name my two closest friends. What was I wearing when we first met? Name one of my hobbies. What stresses am I facing now? What is my fondest unrealized dream? What is one of my greatest fears or disaster scenarios? What is my favorite way to spend an evening? What is my favorite way to be soothed? What are some important events coming up in my life? How do I feel about them? Name one of my favorite books or movies. And what is my favorite restaurant? So I want to pause for a minute because these can seem like they aren't meaningful. They can seem superficial. But even when I just was reading through them and preparing for this, <laughs> um, I realized I, some of them bring nostalgia up for me. Some of them, um, I, I felt pleasure of, oh, I know that answer. Others kind of made me feel sad, like, oh, I don't, I don't know if I know that one, or I don't know if my partner knows that about me. Um, might have hopes, oh, I, 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 this is what I want. I hope to have this kind of relationship where my partner knows these things about me, where I know these things about my partner. Um, and you also might have attended to some judgment even coming up to say, oh, that's stupid. <laughs> Who cares about this stuff? Or I don't even know that about myself. Um, and if that did come up, <clears throat> or it really any of those things that came up, 
just pay attention to it. And can we compa compassionately, ugh, my mouth, can we compassionately attune and attend to what's going up in ourselves? Because by the way, that's also super important. We want to often externalize and look to the other person, but we really need to start with ourselves to say, what's going on in me? And if we can be reflective, right? What came up in me even in asking those questions? So then the next one is <clears throat> sharing fondness and admiration. This one, so I'm gonna give you, I'll give you a sneak preview of the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. One of those is contempt. So when you have contempt in your relationship, that is the highest predictor for divorce. Um, and any, any questions about what contempt is or what that might look like in a relationship? Or does everybody um, feel like we've got a good grasp on what contempt is? No, please explain. Okay, <laughs> so contempt, and actually we will get into it later because um, it is one of the slides later on, but contempt, so the first thing I think of when I think of contempt is the expression of it, and it's sort of that like sneer, right? So one corner of the mouth goes up, but really it basically just is utter disregard for the other person. It's an element, feelings of superiority, like whatever I'm feeling is so much more important than what you're feeling right now, and it's just disgust. And you can, you can often see it as an affect on their face. Um, even just if it's for a microsecond, you can kind of see it cross really quickly. Um, and it's just an utter lack of care for that person, just contempt. Whatever you're going through, I don't actually care because what I'm going through is more important. Um, and so just contempt for that person, for their story, that you even have to take time to, to talk with them or, or anything like that. Um, so we will talk more about that, but so the antidote to contempt in a relationship is this, and this is a friendship element. And so it's just sharing fondness and admiration. So when you first start dating somebody, that early stage is called limerence, which is like the early stages of a romantic relationship. And that doesn't usually last through the entire relationship if it's a long-term relationship, right? That's the beginning part. And then it usually ebbs a bit maybe ebbs and flows, but it doesn't, we don't usually stay. It requires a lot of energy. My goodness, staying up late, night, talking on the phone, having all of your thoughts, thinking about that person, that takes a lot of energy. And I don't even know that our bodies could sustain that energy output uh, in a long-term way, but this can usually last up to two years. This is usually when people decide to marry or not marry. Um, <clears throat> So fondness, fondness and admiration, this is what sustains your relationship after that initial fluttery romance uh, ebbs a little bit. Fondness yeah, can include, Andra, huh? yeah. Sorry, there was a question that came up, I think on the contempt area, would it include disgust? Yep, absolutely. And the facial expression, to me, they, they're very similar that, yeah, contempt and disgust, yeah. And it's, if you think about if you've ever been spoken to in that way, or if you've felt contempt coming at you from someone, um, what I experience and what I've seen is that it really, it just dehumanizes. It, it is so devaluing and it just robs the worth of that person because it's just, you're making them so small. It's not even like belittling, right? Belittling is like, you're so stupid. This is like, I don't even see you. <laughs> you're not even worth my eyes being on you in this moment. Just you're taking up the oxygen in my room and it in my world. Um, yeah, so absolutely contempt and disgust, yeah. Um, so fondness and admiration, um, this can look like uh, I'm proud of you. This can be something like I'm attracted to you, I'm impressed by you, or even just I like you, I like to be around you. Um, even more specifically, it can be then I'm proud of the way you fill in the blank. Um, I'm attracted to your fill in the blank, and this could be an internal quality or an external quality. I'm impressed that you fill in the blank, or I like how you. So the more specific we are, the more meaningful it is, and the stronger this level of the house becomes. And then another part of this kind of what's, what's included here too is appreciation. So when you have fondness and admiration or when you're wanting to cultivate that, um, 
appreciation is definitely a part of that. And so be aware of when you're feeling it, say it anytime you feel any of this come up, say it, and then also be willing to receive it when your partner does the same for you. So fondness and admiration. And if when I was talking, if you were thinking like, I can't think of anything or what, what, what might this look like? Um, here are some examples. <clears throat> so even just looking down the list, um, my partner is creative, skillful, sexy, patient, trustworthy, authentic, honest, thoughtful, caring, generous, What's interesting is that the more emotionally intelligent we are and the more we have increased our own emotional vocabulary, all of a sudden, ah, I love it. <laughs> Sorry, Art and Ruth, I love it. <laughs> a, little, a little kiss on the cheek. <laughs> you forgot you were on video, huh? <laughs> I love it. very sweet to see. And my bad, I shouldn't have said it, but that was so sweet. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. So sometimes it can be difficult to identify, right? Especially if you're not at a good place in your relationship. It's so easy to just try to throw the whole thing away to say, um, no, nothing. There's nothing good about my partner. Well, use a tool like this. And there are some, there are some with even more words, um, but I bet you can find at least one. Like there's something that that person, um, that, that brought you to that person, that attracted you to that person, and so lists like this might seem um, elementary, but they're really useful. So then the next level is turning towards instead of turning away. So this one um, is exactly what it says. And I remember in our training, one of the videos that they showed was um, this. So it was in their apartment, right? It was like, I won't in my mind, I'm like, this is like a stalker apartment, but people chose to be there, so it's okay. Um, but so the, the cameras are going and you have the male who was on the couch watching TV and you had the female who was drinking coffee or something from a mug. And he was there just like focused on the TV and she was there kind of just standing. So she wasn't sitting next to him on the couch. She's just standing there <laughs> with her coffee, which we'll get to this too. This is called a bid, a bid for connection. Right, so she's basically there. She's not gotten comfortable. She's basically just her standing there is a bid. It's kind of saying, hey, are you gonna notice me? Or can I take your attention away from that TV for a minute? Um, and so he did not, he did not respond to her bid. He utterly ignored her bid for connection. And this also, I hope you catch it. It's usually a bid for attention, but any bid for attention is really a bid for connection, which I think is a much healthier way to view that. Attention seeking sounds uh, unhealthy or desperate, but really attention seeking behaviors are connection seeking behaviors, which is a more strength based way to view that. Uh, so she's there drinking her coffee and he ignores her. He's on the TV. So she walks in front of the TV, like disrupting his line of vision. She walks in front of the TV to go to the window. And now she's standing at the window drinking her coffee. And he still, he did not look at her. He's just looking at that TV like he was utterly obtuse to the fact, right? So by now, on her part, she's made two bids and he has ignored both. She might now, when she, if she did choose to say something, how do you imagine her tone might be when she says something? Probably not all of the sweet, whatever she was feeling that first time she was standing by the couch where she was kind of looking at him, maybe she was feeling kind of flirty or like, oh, are you gonna notice me? Or, hey, I, I wanna connect. And he does it and now she's walking and now he's just missed several. If she does talk, it's probably not going to be from that same lovey-dovey space. It's probably gonna be a bit edgy, right? <laughs> because he missed those bids. So turning towards is exactly what it sounds like. Basically, be aware of your partner and when they, when they are making a bid. And statistically, what they learned was that after six years of marriage, couples who were still married turned towards each other 86% of the time. Couples who after six, marries, six years of marriage had divorced only turned towards each other 33% of the time. So this is really important. And again, this is just a friendship thing. If my friend came to my door crying, I'm going to ask, what's going on? Like, I'm going to notice what's going on, right? And so just keeping a friendship within your relationship, what's going on with you? Being curious. And, and the more you do this, you're developing a, a habit, a behavioral pattern of checking in, of attuning, 
right? Attuning meaning just like I'm going to tune into what's going on with my partner, with my eyes, with my ears, with my heart, getting a feel for what's going on with them in that moment. Um, and then something else, one last thing to say about um, a bid for connection. In the moment, we might think, what is, what is that bid, right? What is she wanting? Oh, she just wants to talk, or she wants a hug, or she wants to be seen or feel seen. There's also often underneath that bid, there's something called an underlying need. There might be something underneath that bid that's actually a need. I need to feel seen right now. I need to feel connected right now. I feel vulnerable. I need to feel comforted. Um, and this can also come back to building love maps. So if we have built a proper love map, a rich, detailed love map, and if I know that every October is triggering for my partner because of something that my partner went through, then I can now pay attention to that. I can plan for it. And in October, I might be extra mindful so that when those bids come, and that bid for connection might also come as a short fuse. Wow, you seem really irritable. <laughs> what is going on? But kind of we can see how all of these sort of hold hands with each other and, and they really integrate. And there is some overlap between a lot of these. Um, so just building the relational pattern of turning towards your partner instead of turning away. And, it, and it's hard to do this with conflict, right? So if when that woman, if she had verbalized something and it was a little sharp, he could have even more so than just turned away. Or if you turn towards, wow, you spoke sharply to me. That's not like you. I wonder what's going on, right? And so I'm gonna switch screens because I have a little video that I think will be fun to watch together. It's really short. Um, and sound, and it is this one. Imagine you hear your partner let out an exasperated sigh. In that fleeting moment, you have a choice. Keep going about your day or ask what's on their mind. These small daily crossroads may seem insignificant, but the choices you make while interacting with your partner could over time make or break your relationship. The sigh is what relationship researchers, doctors John and Julie Gottman would call a bid for connection. Bids can be small or big, verbal or nonverbal. We can choose to turn towards our partner in these moments and accept their bids, or turn away from them and ignore their bids. The Gottmans have spent the last four decades studying thousands of couples to answer the question, what separates the relationship masters from the relationship disasters. They found a critical difference in how each type of couple responds to bids for connection. In these moments, masters turn towards each other 86% of the time. Disasters turn towards each other only 33% of the time. A tendency to turn towards your partner forms the basis of trust, emotional connection, passion, and a satisfying sex life. When couples break up, it's usually not because of big issues like conflict or infidelity. More often, it's a result of the resentment and distance that build up over time when partners continually turn away from bids for connection. So take a page from the Relationship Masters Playbook. Notice when your partner makes a bid. Show interest, ask questions, nod, listen, and put away your screens. Choose to turn towards your partner. So, <clears throat> just a little visual to give you an idea of what that looks like. And I'm also going to pay attention to our time. And so I might go a little quicker. <laughs> it's a lot. So again, just cursory, just something you can put on the fridge. So the positive perspective is, um, basically this is an emotional bank account. This, the research shows, usually there's an eight to one um, eight positives to help you hold and cope with one negative. Um, in conflict, this decreases to five to one. 
So basically, if you have a lot of conflict and not a lot of positive, you're going to really start feeling that. So the idea is throughout the day, look multiple times throughout the day, look for ways to add money to your emotional bank with your partner. Um, Because basically that conflict, any conflict is going to withdraw a nickel and every positive is just a penny going in. So we got to put lots of pennies in so that when that nickel gets withdrawn, there's still money there to pay it and to maintain your relationship. So the next one is managing conflict. This one, again, each of these could be its own thing, but just the the overview of this. um, Here's what's fascinating. 69% of conflict in a relationship is not gonna go away. 69% of your conflict is called a perpetual problem. And actually only 31% of problems in relationships are resolvable. The rest of them are not resolvable for whatever reason. Your core belief, their core belief, it's not going to change. You still have your core beliefs. So basically the question is kind of picking a person that if you recognize we may never resolve this conflict, then really what it becomes is how are we having a conflict? And can we have a conflict and still maintain fondness and admiration? Can we have a conflict and still know each other, turn towards each other? And if we can, conflict's not a bad thing, right? But it's how are we going to have a conflict? And so there are three things is um, accept your partner's influence. So if my partner tells me I'm behaving a certain way, even if I don't feel like I am, I'm going to accept what my partner is saying because I have fondness and admiration, because I'm going to choose to turn towards and say, even if that's not what I'm putting out, that's what you're getting. Let me look inward. What's going on here? Is there a part of the love map that we can add? Can I share something with my partner that will add to my partner's understanding of me, what's going on with me, right? Dialogue about problems instead of gridlock. When you're just going back and forth, especially over the same thing, That's called gridlock. And that thing is probably one of the 69% of the problems that won't get solved anyway. So so how do we engage through conflict? And then the last one is self-soothing, practice self-soothing. And what this looks like a lot is look inward first. What is going on with me? Especially if I'm riled up, boom, if I came up big and coming out at my partner, I need to take a minute and look in. And I liked um, Elizabeth, which she, her session, she talked about six seconds, right? To pay attention first to what you're feeling. They actually recommend 20 minutes in order to regulate. So they use the physiology, the markers, 20 minutes of doing something you enjoy, go for a walk, read a book that you enjoy, something, watch, watch TikToks that make you laugh or something, but change your emotional state, let your heart rate come down and then come back to it. Um, And so that's managing conflict in a nutshell. Actually, the other thing worth mentioning is an important part of managing conflict is what they call a soft startup. Startups are often, conflict is often initiated by women percentage wise, and it's often men who need more self-soothing and regulating during the conflict. So if we know this, a soft startup is basically the first three minutes and it's how you're choosing to initiate this. And so something that might help with this is this tool. So I feel, so no you statements at all. And this is like the typical, I make fun of this usually because it's so therapeutic. Uh, Use the I statements. I feel like you're an idiot. No, that's not it, right? So I feel, and then what is an adjective? What are you feeling? And then about, so this is without blame, accusation or criticism. So what are you feeling about what's the thing that happened? and just data, just what was the thing? (laughs) And then, and I would like, so you're gonna gently and respectfully state your request or your need. This, again, this doesn't mean that person's gonna be able to meet your need or give you what you're wanting, but how you're engaging in this conflict, this is the stuff that keeps your relationship going forward because I can still be respectful. I want you to know me more. I want you to know how I'm feeling. I wanna know you more. And and then also, this also requires that you go in first. So I'm not coming going, I'm so mad when you blah, blah, blah. If I'm looking in first, I'm going, oh, I'm feeling really mad right now. I wonder why. Oh, because this thing happened and oh, this has been happening a while. Maybe I'm holding on, right? So reflect for yourself first 
And then you have a soft startup when you bring this to your partner's attention or you, so you kind of create a space where it's going to go well. So coming home from a hard day of work, not probably the best time for a soft startup or a conversation about conflict. Um, making... Hey, Andra, if I could interrupt for a second. Back on the giving bids for connection, there was a question. Uh, do men give more bids for connection than women? That's fascinating. I would have to look it up. I don't know offhand, like I said, super cursory. Um, I don't remember hearing that. Um, and even in the work I've done, I don't, I would not, I haven't found that to be true. But for their research, I would want to look back to their research to find out what they discovered about that. But I offhand, I don't recall anything that says that men put out more bids for attention or connection than, than females do. Uh, making life dreams come true. So essentially, this is, uh, this is right back when you were a kid and someone asked you, what do you want to be when you grow up? And this is the same question. Where do you, where do you envision your life in 10 years? Where do you envision your life in 20 years? And sharing this with your partner. So for me, I, um, you know, I mentioned social work, going to grad school. And Mondo became my biggest cheerleader. I was like, yes, go. When are you going to go? Sign up. I got, I got this. I got everything, right? Like he not only was willing to acknowledge and validate my dream, but then was right there with me to make it happen. Um, and, and I hope that, that he's experienced that recipro reciprocally as well. Um, but basically, who do we want to be? Because here's the thing. As humans, you actually, like remember in high school, people signed your yearbook. They're like, never change that's the worst thing ever to tell somebody because that means you're stagnant. Like you're not maturing, you're not learning from life. That's horrible, right? We're young, so we write it, it's okay. But don't live that way, like we change. And so having these conversations regularly allows you to share those dreams because these are fluid just like life maps, they're fluid. You woke up today with a different person than you went to sleep with last night. We're, we're always different people. Our, my experiences today are going to change me. And tomorrow, my partner has an opportunity to get to know the me that I am tomorrow. And life dreams together, being able to dream together is so important. And it is at the top. It's at the higher of the house. Some relationships never get here. Some are only here, but they don't have any of that friendship foundation that they need to make these life dreams come true together. And then we have create shared meaning. This one, um, some people start here, and actually this is part of premarital counseling, things like that, where you actually are deciding what, what is the relationship you want to have? What would you choose for your relationship? Um, one of the philosophies that they put out, and I love this, is that your relationship with you and your partner your relationship has never existed before. You could read all the relationship books you want, but it has never existed before. And so there might be some tools that are helpful, but the two of you are creating something that has never been created before because it's based on who you are as unique individuals and the dynamic of you two coming together to create a shared meaning. And so this is even something as simple as, what does husband mean to you? What does the word wife mean to you? Um, what does home mean? Deciding together, what does play mean? This can be creating rituals. We have annual rituals, celebrating anniversaries, but we also have daily rituals. What do we, how do we want to experience um, leaving every day for work? How do we want to experience reunions, coming back together? Because this is often where some conflict can come from, right? I had a hard day. I came in. You're just over there on the phone or you're watching TV. You didn't even. But if you talk about this beforehand and you discuss, you know, it's really important. I missed you throughout the day. When I come home, I want to be able to greet you first. I want to be able to get a hug and a kiss and know that we come together and then we can go. Somebody else might say, no, no, no. When I come home, I need 20 minutes. I need to just do my thing, get settled in. Whatever it is, it's never existed before. And so the two of you get to build that together. And then the last part of this <clears throat> are these pillars. Without them, the whole house falls down. And these pillars are trust and commitment. And we could have, a, again, a whole conversation about this, but um, on when I was 
In some, some research to refresh this, I found a statement that I really liked, which is um, trust is something you feel and commitment is something you do. And another way that um, someone described commitment is, commitment is choosing to take your partner with you wherever you go. Not physically, but just, I'm mindful of my partner wherever I am. I bring my partner with me. And that that is commitment. Every decision I make, I'm, I'm holding space for my partner in that decision too. And, and you can see how these two things then build back in and strengthen each of those other layers of the house. Um, so this, these are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. So criticism, defensiveness, contempt, and stonewalling. So criticism, <clears throat> this is attacking the character of the partner. So this is not, why can't you do this, right? This is what's wrong with you as a person. When we have criticism in a relationship, this is a marker of disaster and destruction. Then we have defensiveness, which is self-protection, retaliation to ward off a perceived attack. Notice, interesting, it doesn't even have to be an actual attack, but if that person perceives an attack, then we have defensiveness come up, right? This is typically shifting the focus away from the problem onto the other partner, onto their flaws. The problem's not me, it's you. We have stonewalling, which is basically avoiding, withdrawing, shutting down, checking out, tuning out. So this was the dude watching TV. <laughs> he's just, he's not there. He's not present. Habitually avoiding conflict, turning away, acting busy, engaging in obsessive behaviors. This is the whatever, I don't care, I don't need this, I don't need you attitude, right? And then the PS, the resistance, the greatest predictor of divorce, contempt treating the other partner with disrespect or ridicule, thinking of the other person as lesser, the partner feels despised and worthless. The word I'll come back to is dehumanized. Um, using eye rolling, sarcasm, name calling, you're disgusting, you're so stupid, um, that type of language. The thing is too, all of these are um, protective, I'll call them protective strategies, defense mechanisms, right? Um, survival strategies, um, a, a, a great woman in our field calls them survival strategies. These might have been the things that you had to learn to survive based on your childhood, your upbringing, your experiences, but this is not where we wanna stay. And luckily each of these has an antidote. So the antidote for criticism is using a gentle startup, also appreciation, like we talked about, building fondness and admiration, all of these things help with criticism because then maybe I don't need to tell you that you left your socks on the floor again, because actually if I'm building my fondness and admiration, wow, what you accomplished at work today was massive. Let me get your socks for you, <laughs> like, right? So you can see how this can be an antidote for criticism. The cri antidote for defensiveness is for you to take responsibility. Um, none of these are easy, by the way. I just have like two minutes left with y'all. So <laughs> these are hard. Um, taking responsibility. I'm feeling defensive. Even just pay attention to that. I'm feeling defensive. I'm gonna, I wanna start attacking you. Give me a minute. Let me go get myself in order. Then let's come back. Let me recognize. Oh, you feel that I was attacking you? I wasn't attacking you. Or you feel that I was attacking you. Okay, let me look in. Was there anything I did that was construed or oh, well, I didn't, whatever it might be, right? So take responsibility genuinely and authentically, not I'm sorry you feel that way, right? Um, the antidote for contempt is to describe your own feelings and needs, don't describe your partner. So again, this is kind of you owning, and this is you choosing to be vulnerable. Um, so you're humanizing the other person. I'm gonna be vulnerable, I'm gonna describe what I'm needing. You're such a jerk, or I realize I need a lot of physical affection or I'm feeling vulnerable right now. I need a hug or I need to talk. Um, I had a rough day. I need to talk with you. Whatever you're feeling rather than coming in with the need and your partner doesn't even know that it's there. It's a little, a little unfair, right? And then stonewalling, the antidote for stonewalling is to physiologically self-soothe. So if you're avoidant and you've checked out, 
guess what? Let's check back in with our body first. What is going on with me? What am I feeling? Am I just numbing? Is my heart racing? Is my stomach in knots? Are my fists clenched? Paying attention to your own physiology, attending to yourself, give yourself what you're needing to regulate, and then come back to your partner. Um, because again, all of those parts of um, the four horsemen or the, the sound relationship house can get strengthened by, by doing that. So we will come back to where we started. I, like I said, I, I, I didn't lie to you. I, I set you up to know that this is gonna feel like a massive, um, lot of information, but is there one thing? Is there maybe one thing that you thought, ooh, that was a new thought, or I totally disagree with that, or something you experienced in your body, or maybe just something you wanna think more about, or what's your TOT, what's your TOT, what's the one thing? the one thing you want to take away from our time together. And that, and now I, now I can take a breath. <laughs> um, it, is, it is 1130, but I would love to have just opportunity for um, you all to, to have, can we, can we if, and if you got to go, it's 1130, you can totally go. But if you want, I would love to take just five minutes and either you can unmute yourself or in the chat, um, just kind of share how this experience was for you. It doesn't have to be up here. It can be a body thing too. It can be, I felt really tense through the whole thing or, oh my, I felt my shoulders come down or um, just whatever, Any anything you'd like to share and as you reflect. Just a reminder that we're going to continue recording. <laughs> so if you want to share something that you don't want it to be recorded, then don't share that, share something else. That's right. Or you can also put it in the chat and I just promise to try to remember not to read it out loud. I felt parts of me. I felt sad, I, uh, sadness, you know, mm -hmm. some lament about the state of my relationship. But on the other hand, I felt optimism with some of the tools you gave, mm -hmm. and to remember that it begins with me, and don't mm -hmm. look outside, because if I can't begin it here, I can't expect him to end it. Mm -hmm. I can't expect him to meet me in the place. Thank you for sharing that. That was so true. And I definitely connect with that too, feeling some sadness because those points where you recognize I'm not thriving in this element of my relationship, it kind of feels like a wound. And when you'd speak to it or it's brought up, oof, that one hurts because I'm not living in that fullness yet. But the fact that you can now name that fullness means again, name it to tame it, which is a, also a therapy thing, right? But if I can say it, oh, if I, now I know it's there. I, and I can't control somebody else, but I can look in and I can apply things. I can do my part and then see, right? Um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. This was great for me as a, a reminder to, because I've, I've heard this before, not from you, but from, you know, my own therapist. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm in therapy. That can be on the recording, Dad. <laughs> um, I mean, but it should probably all be. Here. I know. <laughs> it's never a bad thing, right? Um, but it was so great to see. It, it was so great for me to see like, oh, yeah, that's what we started out with. And man, we were close to the, maybe the four apocalypse horsemen there at the beginning, but wow, we've come so far and oh my gosh, you know, not only are we still together, but we're actually thriving now. And we are, I just noticed, and I'm thinking back right now, we, we turn towards each other so much now where we never did at the beginning, those little bids for attention and connection. I'm actually seeing them from him. And he is like, the antithesis of you know whatever <laughs> trying you know it, it's weakness to him to want to you're seeing it from him this is a good thing <laughs> yes, exactly exactly yeah. it's not just me going hey look at me look at me it's the other way around so it, it's just it's really good yes it's a lot of information and i think i want to watch this again but it was um it was really good thank you andre very good Glad to hear it. Yeah, it's always nice to have as a reflective tool too. If you are familiar with this too, to be able to go, oh, I forgot we started there and look where we are now. If this is your first time you've ever heard this, you can also go online and find a bunch more information. It's also, you can also find a certified therapist that's certified in this method. And it's very 
um, clinical. It's like surveys. And then there are specific interventions that guide you through wherever you might be stuck in this. And so just to put that out there as well, if you're feeling like, I, what? Um, you can also go and, and find a, a therapist that can do more of this work with you. Anybody else want to give some reflection? Hmm. Lot to work on. Somebody put in the comment, lot to work on, much to reflect on, good tools to help with relationships, to help them thrive. Yeah. And then other people feeling like this should be part of premarital counseling. Absolutely. Um, and how this can apply to all important relationships. Yes, I agree. Work relationships, parent-child relationships, sibling relationships. Absolutely. All right. Well, I mean, I think most of y'all have my contact information. If you want to um, have any questions or if you're trying to get online or not able to find some of the resources, I'd be happy to email um, the, the, but it's all, it's all there. You could Google Sound Relationship House and the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Uh, there's a lot of YouTube videos. I had one more to, to show you, but even if you wanted to jump on, um, there's a lot there too. Gottman is G-O-T-T-M-A-N. And um, those can be really helpful as well.